Support for this podcast comes from the Central Valley Journalism Collaborative, connecting communities with the resources, infrastructure, and networks to ensure a vibrant local free press. From KBPR in Fresno, this is Central Valley Daily. It's Tuesday, August 5th. I'm Elizabeth Arcalian. Coming up, farmers and beekeepers were stunned to witness a mass bee die-off earlier this year, but they didn't know quite what was causing it until now. This past spring, we have reached really unprecedented levels of loss. So I think about 62%, which is about 1.6 million colonies. What brand new research says is behind this die-off and what agencies are doing about it. We'll have that conversation right after these news headlines. Several seasonal employees at Yosemite National Park were working without pay for up to six weeks. That's according to new reporting by NPR. Park supervisors scrambled to hire workers amid federal budget cuts. Employees say they are now receiving hourly wages, but still have yet to be paid for the work they did as volunteers. Last week, a spokeswoman for the Department of Homeland Security said people in the U.S. under the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival status should consider self-deporting. Jessica smith Bobadia represents immigrants and refugees in the Valley. She tells KVPR she was surprised by the shift in tone towards those with the DACA permit, especially since the program has been in effect for 10 years. Those students and permit holders should be taking all affirmative steps to consult with qualified nonprofits and immigration attorneys to see what their other options might be and try to map out a plan if the program is abruptly or at some point discontinued. She also says people should keep copies of legal records in case they are detained or placed in deportation proceedings. California Attorney General Rob Bonta says his office has restored $168 billion in federal funds to the state through legal action against the Trump administration. The AG's office has spent $5 million so far to sue the federal government. Bonta says this means the state has saved more than $33,000 for every $1 spent. Just to put it in perspective, if you told a Wall Street investor they'd get a $33,000 return on every $1 invested. They would trip over themselves to get in on that deal. Lawmakers approved up to $25 million in funds for California to sue the federal government during a special session last fall. Republican lawmakers opposed the funding, saying it was hasty for Democrats to rush to Trump-proof California before Trump even took office. California has sued the Trump administration 37 times in the last 28 weeks. Bonta says the $5 million his department received so far has not covered all the expenses and that he'll likely need more funds. A Lake Isabella resident known for her devotion to protecting the lake's natural beauty has died. As KVPR's Samantha Rangel reports, Eva Holman was often called the Lady of the Lake. Eva Holman spent her later years watching over Isabella Lake. She picked up lots of trash and rescued injured animals. She also informed residents on the lake's dam safety modification project and placed makeshift buoys near underwater rocks to keep boaters safe. The Bakersfield Californian reports she was a former yacht builder turned windsurfer, and many friends told the newspaper she built strong relationships with local communities, always pushing for a safer, cleaner lake. Holman died on a recent evening of cancer. She was 78. With KVPR News, I'm Samantha Ringo. Valley Children's Hospital has noticed an alarming spike in serious facial injuries among young football players. Doctors have treated over a dozen nasal fractures this summer alone. Hospital officials say the injuries are some of the worst they've seen. Valley Children's is urging schools and athletic programs to stop contact football drills without helmets. They also remind coaches and families to prioritize hydration during practices and games, especially because of the Valley heat. The 2025 edition of KVPR's $10,000 drawing is underway. Do your part and support the station by purchasing a ticket for a chance to win $10,000. Tickets are $100 each and limited to 800 sold. Other prizes include a two-night stay at the Cottage Inn in Pismo Beach and $250 to dine at restaurants in your community. 
Tickets are available now at kdpr.org 10k. And now to our main story. The largest honeybee die-off on record was reported in the U.S. earlier this year. Pollinator bees are vital for the Valley's agriculture industry. They help almonds and fruit trees in the blooming process, so those crops can yield the nuts and fruits we all enjoy later in the year. Farmers depend heavily on beekeepers to bring these bees to their orchards or fields. So imagine how beekeepers felt when they discovered their colonies were decimated and they had just a fraction of their typical bees to offer. But the lingering question no one's been able to answer for some time regarding this die-off is why did it happen? According to brand new USDA research, part of the reason for this die-off could lie in a small mite in the colonies. Those mites appear to have developed a resistance to a widely used pesticide and in turn spread a virus. To break down these recent findings, we spoke with Professor Alina Nino. She's an apiculture, or beekeeping expert, who runs a bee lab at UC Davis. She starts by illustrating the myriad ways bees support our food supply. Honeybees pollinate numerous crops, uh, fruit crops, so for example, plums, cherries, uh, we use honeybees for pollinating those, uh, a lot of different nuts, of course, including almonds, stone fruits, even even uh, alfalfa seed production. Alfalfa obviously is uh, fed to dairy cattle. And technically, I guess we could say that we owe ice cream to honeybees as well. Although there are definitely some other bees that are providing pollination for alfalfa and other crops as well. Honeybees, of course, are used for honey production, and California regularly ranks second or third in the country in terms of production of uh, honey. Um, And then we also get other products of the hive. So wax, for example, it's often used for cosmetics production. And of course, propolis. Propolis, we can eat it as well. It has antimicrobial properties, and those are plant resins that are collected by bees, and we can extract that as well and incorporate it into, for example, cough syrups. Okay, so, so many uses all along the food chain and and in other industries as well. So that really highlights the point that a few months ago, when farmers were trying to pollinate their crops, there Mm -hmm. was a huge issue. There were no bees. They were dying. So can you paint us a picture of where the industry was at at that time just a few months ago? Uh, So obviously, you've had others on your program as well talking about it, but it is really serious. So I'm glad that we're talking about it some more. Beekeepers uh, starting in January recorded and reported about 60% loss. And those are really huge losses for beekeeping industry. Since the time when we started actually recording the losses of honeybees, annual losses, the losses usually have been kind of uh, hovering around 40, sometimes even up to 50 percent. But this past spring, we have reached really unprecedented levels of loss. So I think about 62 percent, which is about 1.6 million colonies. So that is a tremendous loss to the beekeepers to agriculture industry in general. And I think when we, because we are humans, we like to think in the amounts of dollars, right? That's about a $600 million loss for those beekeepers. And it's really important to stress that economically that might not be sustainable for much longer. So beekeepers really need our help. Um, And again, we are a crucial part of the agriculture and food production system. Certainly. And since that extreme bee die-off, many in the science community have sort of struggled to figure out what happened. Uh, There's some new research from the Mm -hmm. Department of Agriculture that's suggesting there may have actually been a bee virus. Tell us about that. Yes. So my colleagues at USDA uh, labs um, across the country have actually acted really quickly. It was amazing, the response. They um, came on site. They collected the bees. Strong, weak colonies, healthy bees, sort of um, struggling, unhealthy, uh, morbid bees. And they just recently published the results of their sampling and their uh, research. And they found that there is an unusually a much higher amount uh, and incidence of specifically deformed wing virus, two different variants, and then the acute bee paralysis virus. 
And those seem to be highly correlated with the morbid individual bees that they collected separately from those that were not exhibiting any type of symptoms. And they went a step further to show that this is indeed what has been killing the bees. They actually created an inoculum from those morbid bees, from those sick bees, and they fed it back to healthy bees in cages. And those healthy bees, once they were fed these inocula, they also perished really quickly. And I think there was one sentence in that paper that was recently published saying that one of those sick bees had enough virus to kill about 66 million individual bees. And then to exacerbate that issue, we have varroa mites, and varroa mites can vector these viruses. And I think one of the other main findings of this research was that we are now finding that a lot of the varroa mite populations are resistant to amitraz, which is a miticides that a lot of beekeepers have been relying on being able to manage those varroa mites. So there are a lot of different factors that are playing a role in this collapse. You mentioned those parasitic mites and that there Mm -hmm. may have been sort of a resistance developed to that main chemical that's used to control them. Looking back, were there any indicators that bees were developing a resistance to that pesticide? Yes, and this is actually not the first time that this has happened. Uh, So varomites came into the United States back in the 1980s, late 1980s, um, and they really devastated the industry uh, because we just didn't have any tools that were effective enough to eradicate varomites. That would have been really the greatest option, but uh, we just didn't have the tools. And then the bees really were struggling to deal with this novel pathogen with this novel parasite. And the beekeepers and researchers then started applying cumafos and fluvalinate. So they were two different miticides at the time, but the varomites developed resistance to those as well. Um, And then we kept researching and adding to this toolbox, which is, by the way, still very, very small. Um, We added a few other miticides, including amitraz, and then um, those ended up being sort of the most effective miticide, and the beekeepers heavily relied on it because they were losing some of these other options. Um, And they slowly noticed that they needed to apply more and more amitraz to be able to control Hmm. varroa mites. So we did have some indication that varroa mites were going to develop resistance most likely, um, and now it's kind of being more and more confirmed. Uh, We still rely on amitraz. We do have a few other options, but I think everybody would agree with me, beekeepers, researchers, it is really important to be able to continue to have funding to support development of novel miticides because as beekeepers, we're really struggling. We have, as I said, a very small toolbox and we really need help to develop some of these novel miticides. And there is some research being done and there are some newer miticides that are going through the registration process with EPA. So there's um, hopefully some hope, but we really do need help. Alina Nino, professor of apiculture at UC Davis. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me on the program. And as Professor Nino mentioned, KVPR covered this historic bee die-off when it was happening earlier this year. You can listen to our March 5th and April 9th episodes. That's where we break down what happened with a San Francisco Chronicle reporter and KVPR's own Carrie Klein, respectively. And that's today's show. Today's episode was produced by Jonathan Linden and KVPR with support from the Central Valley Journalism Collaborative. I'm Elizabeth Arcalian. You can find the latest local news anytime at kvpr.org. These days, there's so much news, it can be hard to keep up with what it all means for you, your family, and your community. The Consider This podcast from NPR features our award-winning journalism. Six days a week, we bring you a deep dive on a news story and provide the context and analysis that helps you make sense of the news. We get behind the headlines. We get to the truth. 
Listen to the Consider This podcast from NPR.